Tony. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and uh, my guests today are Diane Clark from uh, the Greystone Nature Preserve and Sandy Emke who was also on my TV show almost two years ago with Diane and Bill um, because she was being one of their interns uh, that summer and um, thank you for coming on um, thank you, for having us, you know now Diane I heard that you and Bill adopted a puppy this <laughs> this winter we did mm -hmm. yes we did we mm -hmm. have a five-month-old Australian Shepherd Mm -hmm. And we're calling her Beanie. Beanie. Yeah. Okay. Now, Sandy, I, I'm kind of surprised. Um, I didn't know if I'd ever see you again <laughs> or not when you were on the TV show two years ago. Uh, yeah. But here you are. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, now, tell us what your educational background is. All right. Well, actually, I have a pretty um, varied background in a bunch of different education aspects, but most all of all of it's been around environmental science and biology. Right now I'm actually going back to SUNY Fredonia. I just graduated with my undergrad and now I'm continuing for my graduate degree and I'm working with biology and I had the um, amazing experience of being able to be promoted in Greystone to the assistant director, so oh. that was also another thing, you know, keeping me here in Fredonia and staying with Fredonia School and stuff, so that was oh, so Oh, awesome. okay. Yeah. So you like being part of Greystone then. I love it, yeah. 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 Okay, and um, now I hear that you're quite the expert on bats yeah. and... Um, uh, um, invasive species plants and um, so we uh, will get to talking about uh, those subjects um, now one of you um, let, tell us about Greystone oh, I'll take that over for a little <laughs> bit yeah go ahead <laughs> Greystone Nature Preserve was founded in 1998 when my husband and I were working at the Casadega Job Corps as the outdoor recreation or re outdoor education facilitators. And we got to love that job so much that when we got laid off in 2008, we actually turned our not-for-profit status, our 501c3, into an educational facility. And at Greystone Nature Preserve, our keynote is that we teach experiential education. So as people in our 70s, we're not having to memorize all the botanical names that Sandy knows so well. What we do is when any visitors, children or adults, come, we try to lead them into relaxing with nature. And then we follow them on whatever adventures their curiosity takes them to. So they experience nature rather than kind of standing above it and naming it and telling the uses of different things. We would approach a tree and wonder what it thinks of its neighbors and how it gets along with the other animals. And by asking those kind of questions, kind of get our visitors to get the essence of the tree and to appreciate its role in the environment. And after that, we may talk a bit about stewardship because those are the three main elements at Greystone Nature Preserve. Developing a sense of awe, engendering some kind of appreciation of nature, and then recognizing that at this day and age, we all need to be stewards. Mm -hmm. So other than that, it's 72 acres that are dedicated to preserving our natural flora and fauna, and we are eradicating those invasive species along the way. Okay, so what type of programming do you have? We mostly have what Henry David Thoreau would call rambles. Rambles? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when people get off of their vehicles, uh, they might be greeted by our dog first thing mm -hmm. and so that's a good way to interact with nature right there and then they might also be greeted by our chicken flock mm 
Oh, yeah. And from there, they might get a whole education without even knowing it about chickens and how chickens live, how they breed, how they lay eggs, and things like that. And then we might poke at some suggestions, but we really try to let these lessons evolve into the woods where they might get onto a two-man saw and see what it was like before there was a real use of petroleum products and people did their own work with muscle power. We might amble down onto our creek and have a walk in the, in the creek. Our job course students love that because most of them coming from the cities, they don't have a chance to just be on their own walking in a creek might take them up to our medicine wheel and let them see Lake Erie and the surrounding countryside. But all of our educational program is aimed at their discovery and at their developing this sense of connection with nature. In general, um, just some of the actual um, programs that we do every year. We are now um, developing and increasing our field days programs. So that's where we're having elementary students, mostly pre-K and kindergarten students from our local area coming into Greystone and, you know, enjoying the close to the last day of school, you know, at Greystone and enjoying nature that way. Um, we also do programs um, like festivals and things like that. And then, as Diane was saying, a lot of our programs come from like Job Corps or the Resource Center, um, a lot of organizations. We like to connect with them and then develop programs with them. Okay, that sounds really nice. Now, what animals and plants do you look to preserve and help? All right, well, recently we actually started a, um, we're starting to transition a portion of our uh, nature preserve into a sanctuary. And the animals that we actually are looking to uh, preserve, I guess, in that aspect are bats, birds, and butterflies. So we, we, know, we know that these, these species are getting a lot of um, negative, I guess, environmental impacts on them. So we are just looking to help those, those uh, species in any, ways we, any way we can. And then for um, native flora, we're really just looking for any type of plant out there that is native. We try to eradicate any invasive species, and then we try to bring in and um, nurture all of the actual native plants we have on the premises. Oh, yeah. And uh, in terms of the bats, um, We've, tried it, we've transitioned in our look toward nature from being just a preserve, Greystone Nature Preserve, into the bat, bird, and butterfly sanctuary because these species are, some of the members of these species are in dire need of just being able to live on our planet. The little brown bat, there were tens of thousands at Chautauqua Institution and this summer, yeah. or last summer, Barely one was recorded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have not just bat houses, but maternity bat houses oh. put up. Yeah. These are 20 pound things that go up and, um, oh, I think it's 18 feet. Mm -hmm. So they're substantial and we're hoping to help the bat population that way. And as far as birds go, we cooperate with a local f farmer and he does not cut his hay fields that he has on our property. He does not cut them until the meadowlarks and the bobolinks have fledged. Because so often these birds are just coming out of the nest or they're still in the nest and the fields get cut. Oh. And in that way we know we are preserving them. We have our bird expert tell us, oh that's, that's five more that'll get out into the world now. And as far as butterflies go, um, we're probably the leading planters <laughs> of, of milkweed. And not just milkweed, but many other meadow flowers that all butterflies thrive on. So now that's our focus, is trying to be a sanctuary to those species. And um, in terms of the trees, we're doing uh, tree planting. We'll maybe talk about that later, but we felt like the land needs more trees, so wherever we can get a tree in there, we do. We've planted only over 300 trees of different types for 
erosion control sometimes, but also just as wildlife habitat. And mm -hmm. they're all native or they've been naturalized to the area. Now, I have not really been seeing any bats around our house mm -hmm. for the last couple of years. And for the few years before they seemed to disappear, I was seeing them out during out and about during daylight hours um, on bright sunny days. Does that have something to do with uh, that white nose disease? Um, white nose doesn't make bats come out during the day. Uh -huh. um, what no white nose syndrome actually does is it affects the b bat's hibernation. Oh. So it's a fungus that attacks their face and then it um, kind of affects their breathing during hibernation. So they wake up frequently, and when bats wake up during hibernation, they actually end up um, exerting a lot of their resources that they built up. Because mm -hmm. unlike bears, they don't you know, eat a bunch before they go hibernating. Oh, I see. So, yeah, so if they wake up during hibernation for extended periods or too often, they actually can die or dehydrate just from the fact that they're waking up during their hibernation. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what that white nose fungi fungus actually does, is it wakes, it up, wakes them up during that time. So it, it sounds a lot like um, that sleep apnea that some people get. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot like that. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. Well, uh, tell us more um, about uh, the bats then. All right. Um, there's actually here in western New York, we have about eight species. Um, all of these species are very, very vital to us. Uh, we only have insect eating populations here. So even though they aren't dispersing seeds and fruits here, they still are eating thousands and thousands and millions of insects each night, which is so beneficial to our ecosystem and just to us, because the more bats you have in the backyard, the less mosquitoes you have. So mm -hmm. their bats are just very amazing. And like you said, um, not only has the white nose syndrome affected them and made them decrease, um, mm -hmm. but we've had things like windmill development that mm -hmm. they found has been hurting their populations, mm -hmm. um, even just collisions with buildings and roads while they're flying. Um, there's, you know, even human prosecution is a big one. People are very afraid of bats, so oh, then every time oh they yeah. see them, they decide they have to eradicate them. And oh, yeah. Th yes, that's not, not the case. And, yeah. you know, if, if you do have bats in your house, get a hold of us at Greystone, you know, and we would love to find a professional who knows how to properly get rid of them and where no harm is done to the humans and no harm is done to the bats. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So they can, can, like, capture them and take them to other areas yep. then? Yep. Oh, Very okay. Much so, yeah. um, now, I remember going to um, a festival that you had out at Greystone the summer before last, mm -hmm. and um, I, I've always had a phobia of bats. I think it was sort of introduced to me, yeah. you know, by people that didn't understand. Right. Um, but uh, you had some speakers there, and um, that um, at that festival that kind of helped me uh, come to grips with my fear of bats Good. a little yeah. bit. One of them was Merlin Tuttle. Yeah. Um, and he was he was talking about them and and then there was another lady. What was what was her name? Uh, Caroline Bissell. Caroline Bissell. Yeah. Okay, uh, from Chautauqua. Yeah. 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 And uh, that that kind of helped me a lot, but then after that it seemed like I wasn't seeing Right. the bats anymore. Yeah, right. um, so what do you think uh, was the reason that I was seeing bats out during the out and about during the day in the sunlight then? Um, the only thing that would be related possibly to a sickness or something like that um, I would not, most people would jump to rabies right away, but uh -huh. I wouldn't say that because uh -huh. honestly, it has been shown that bats actually contract bit rabies less than most other mammals. Oh, do and they if, really? Yeah, and if you think uh -huh. about it, um, like rodents are one of the number one carriers of r rabies. So if you actually like think about where bats are located and where like mice and other you know animals that can um, be 
vectors, you know, mm -hmm. for that to, to actually contract. Bats are up in the sky or in caves or they're up in high places. So they're, they're not normally coming in contact with animals that do have rabies. So oh, I see. I wouldn't say that, you know, it would be that, but it probably could have been a sickness or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or if it's um, dusk, like if it was sort of getting a little bit dark too. Like no, I'm talking about early afternoon in the summer on a sunny day. Hmm, yeah, it could have been just an illness or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's not a normal behavior. I wouldn't say that was white nose or anything like that either. It could have just been, you know, something happened to that bat or it, that it little colony or something. Mm -hmm. It could have been as easy as a cat got up into the attic and where they were. Them, yeah. Um, hanging, resting, oh. or a dog disturbed them. I would think it would be something like that mm -hmm. as uh -huh. opposed to um, the never come out and look for people, that's <laughs> right. for sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it was There's just, so it just myths. seemed really, just, it just seemed yeah. really scary, like, right. ooh, you know, this isn't normal, you know, right. usually you don't see them till dusk. And yeah. And then they go into wherever s they spend the daytime hours, mm -hmm. you know, at dawn. So, yeah. Um, are there any? Is there anything y else you want to tell us um, about uh, these species that you're here to talk about today? Just that they're vital. They're vital to, you know, our our environment, but pretty much just to our county, to everything that we have here. They're they're just very vital, and we need to protect them as much as we can. And you know, little things, little things count, you know, putting up a bat house, putting up a bird house, anything mm -hmm. like that can really help and people don't think it does, but mm -hmm. it really can. It really does. Yeah. Okay. Um, can people visit the property whenever they want to? Basically, we're open from dawn to dusk, from May through the end of October, mm -hmm. and we have a waiver that people sign so that we know they're on the property mm -hmm. and if anything happens to them. And other than that, they're welcome to walk the trails and enjoy nature. So the answer is yes. Okay. Okay, can they bring dogs? Well, we have that chicken flock there. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, dogs are wonderful things, and we have a dog, of course. Um, and the thing is, if they let the dog off a leash, mm -hmm. then we might get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Because the chickens are there as they are near the entrance to the prop to the woods and then um, the woods are full of rough grouse, turkeys, a lot of nesting birds are on the ground. Mm -hmm. So we would definitely prefer that dogs stay on the leash. Mm -hmm. Oh okay, it's they can yeah. come but yes, yes. keep the dog on the it's leash. It's mandatory that they They're stay on the leash. On the leash. Okay. We prefer if you pick up after them of course. But oh, yeah. oh yes. Yep, you yes. Know. We, yes. So we do want you to bring your four-legged friends as long as, you know, they're also not known to hurt, you know, other animals and things like okay. that. Okay. So as long as they're friendly and stay on a leash. <laughs> okay. Um, how has uh, Greystone affected the citizens of Chautauqua County? Well, I think as modern-day pressures get more and more, we find people want to come up. You would think they'd want to come up for environmental education. But our community members want to come up to meditate, mm -hmm. to contemplate, to get away. It's silly, but some of them just want to come up to experience silence because you can still get it up there. And just the way the land unfolds, we have this panoramic view that goes all the way across Lake Erie. And sometimes people just want to come up and sit on a bench and mm -hmm. look at the view. Mm -hmm. So that's one way I think that we benefit the community. And then because we're, we have schools like Pine Valley who come for field days, we think we're benefiting the whole community because we keep our field days open to the family. Mm -hmm. So the whole family is going back to talk about their day in the country. And our programs with the Resource Center and the Job Corps certainly benefit the community because we're helping those contingent factors to be happy and, and to appreciate nature. Mm -hmm. So those are some of our ways. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as uh, to get away from the noise, um, there are noises, nature noises out yes, there, yeah. but they're more, but they're very soothing. They're more soothing than traffic and, oh, and yes. all that, yes. yeah. Um, 
Why is it important for children to be out in nature? I could say so they and the whole world can stay alive. <laughs> um, I think one of the sayings that we actually wrote in one of our recent grants actually kind of says it really well, and I like to use it all the time because it's just a good saying, I guess, that you know, kids nowadays are much more familiar with robots than they are robins. And that's pretty sad. Like when you, when you put you know, food down in front of a kid, a kid should be able to understand that you know, that came from an animal or that came from a plant, but a lot of that connection isn't there today. And you know, that's, it's, it's pretty sad you know, when kids don't know where their food comes from or they don't understand you know, that trees produce our oxygen and that we need them. And it's just good for them to understand where these things come from and understand how their world around them works. And you know, that connection with nature, I feel like, just like like you were saying, it's just a relaxing and like it's a, s a sensation you don't get anywhere else. I feel yeah. There's something about being out in nature. Um, if you are having a day where you feel really nervous and tense and nervous, uh, you can go out and walk in the woods for a while. And uh, walking on the bare ground. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. In nature, um, after you've walked a certain uh, amount of time, you start to feel relaxed. Yeah. There's just something about it. Yeah. There is, there is. Yeah, it's, that's an awesome question because it, it's, it's so big. Uh, and and it, it's hard to say that children need to know where they came from too, mm -hmm. that they are natural creatures. Mm -hmm. Some of them are becoming as oh computerized yeah. as yeah, the toys yeah. they play with. And you know, myself as a child, I got to go out and test myself on mm -hmm. nature and to uh, create my own games, mm -hmm. create my own fantasy worlds. And children are sadly lacking in that today. So I, I think it's healing. And <laughs> I'm going back to Thoreau again, but <laughs> as, as Thoreau said, in nature is the preservation of us all. Right, right. It's like the um, like the dead zones in the ocean that are in the ocean now yeah. from too much fishing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's how think of the blight our cities and roads and that are on the natural world. I know. And kids are growing up thinking that's what it is. Mm -hmm. When we tell them, no, this isn't the real world inside this classroom. This is all made, man-made. This mm -hmm. is produced. Mm -hmm. The real world is out there where we're going to go. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're amazed by that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tell us uh, about yourselves. Um, what are each of your positions at Greystone, and how did you become a part of Greystone? The elder here, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my husband and I bought the property in 1998, and we stood with the realtor on a, a little outcropping, and it was a cornfield at the time. And we looked down, why you couldn't see another house, you couldn't see the highway or the prison, you couldn't see anything but nature. Our natural Chautauqua landscape flowing in its like ripples down to the lake. And you look across the lake and well, there's the Canadian shore. It looks so much like our neighbors rather than a foreign country. Mm -hmm. It's right over there. And Bill and I looked at each other and we said, oh, we can never have this. And the realtor goes like, oh, yeah, you could have this. This is really very inexpensive property. <laughs> and we looked at each other again and said, we couldn't do it. And he was beside himself, but we were of one heart, knowing we had already bought the land mm -hmm. in our hearts. The mm -hmm. pocketbook money, we didn't know how we'd do, but mm -hmm. we were already owners of that property. What we meant was, we could never put a house on that perfect place oh. and that we could never own that land just ourselves like a possession mm -hmm. and it was right there I think that we took the first steps to becoming a 501c3 although it mm -hmm. took a couple years mm -hmm. um, and uh, so 
from there it just flowed. When we were let go by the Job Corps, we had a year of depression, and then we came out of that knowing that that was the work we wanted to do in our lives, and there wasn't anything to do since there weren't any jobs available for us to even be lifeguards or camp counselors. Oh, so we said, if we want that wonderful experience we had with Job Corps, we'll have to create it ourselves. And a young lady came along and helped us write the 501c3 that was formal and um, we started doing the classes and now the Job Corps comes to us on Saturday so it's a real nice circle. So that's me and I just try to keep things running. Okay Sandy, the uh, spark plug. Um, tell us about yourself, uh, your position at Greystone and how you became a part of it. So we already kind of talked about it a little bit in the beginning. So I did start back in 2016 at Greystone. Um, I was an intern then, um, working with, through SUNY Fredonia. And um, ever since that summer, I just decided that I just loved the place so much that I was going to do work with them, you know, however it was, if it was just volunteer work or whatever. And, you know, um, two years later, they asked me to be a board member. And a few months after that, I was asked to be the assistant director and now I just work with them that way but it's you know when I started back in 2016 I would have never expected you know for all the experiences that I've had with Greystone to be part of an internship mm -hmm. so like just being part of an internship and getting all those experiences it was you know it was amazing to be able to be promoted and to get to where I am today because because of Greystone so yeah okay um so what are your favorite aspects of teaching environmental education? For me, I guess it would be like I love especially when I teach the very young kids asking them like what they what they know about nature first and kind of hearing the goofy things that they say and then kind of re-asking the question at the end and seeing what their you know how their answers change throughout the lessons and just seeing like the awe and the the um, excitement and the fun in their eyes when they learn about things that you know you don't get in school like instead of us forcing numbers down they get to play with a fluffy bat or something like that and like just seeing that connection and that excitement is very it's, mm -hmm. it's very exciting and mm -hmm. very beneficial oh yeah. yeah I've learned way more uh, over the years uh, since I was a child in school mm -hmm. than I ever did in school right mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely um, uh, so, um, who is your favorite environmental writer? I al we already have established that Diane's is probably Henry <laughs> David Thoreau. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who would yours be? That's that's a hard question, honestly. I don't think I have a specific favorite writer. You like um, lots of them. Yes, and that's that's mm -hmm. the problem. You know, there's there's the the of course people like Rachel Carlson and stuff like that but um, I would actually say that she'd probably have to be my top one just because she Rachel got Carson yeah because yeah. she got everything started right you know, so right. that was yeah she wrote um, uh, Silent Spring you know, yeah, yeah. that kind of really yeah. started all the writings on you know not how people feel about nature you know rather than the statistics of oh this is this this and that you know science instead of just being science based it was more emotional and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so have you ever read any of uh, Jane Goodall's books I have not yeah uh, she uh, has some pretty interesting books okay. on, uh, on nature uh, mm -hmm. she was one of the ladies uh, um, that was involved in, pr in studying and protecting different kinds of primate animals. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 Um, if you ask me currently, <laughs> oh, okay. uh, Henry David Thoreau is like my bedrock, uh -huh. but my favorite uh, environmental writer for modern times is a man named uh, Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen? And probably mm. a lot of people haven't heard of him. He came to Chautauqua Institution about 20, 25 years ago, uh -huh. and he did experiential activities with a group of us that just blew me away, uh -huh. uh, discovering nature in ways, like you said, you know, you're, you've learned more since when you were a child. Right, right. Well, experiences that just 
were astonishing and full of awe. And I thought, boy, this, this guy is really neat. So I recommend Michael Cohen. It's C-O-H-E-N, Cohen. Mm -hmm. um, he's a PhD, and he's out in Washington State. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he really has it. He's got the idea of we need to be connected to nature. That's one of his books, Our Connection to Nature. And we need to feel this bonding that's a part of all of this life cycle around us. So that's mm -hmm. my guy. <laughs> okay. Um, now you have an upcoming event uh, on Earth Day. Uh, let's uh, talk about that. Uh, you've got um, uh, kind of a brochure here. You have a little flyer there. Yeah. Um, so, um, tell, so tell us about this then. All right, a so day with the trees. Yeah. Well, as Diane mentioned, um, we love trees. We want to plant trees as much as we can, as often as we can. So the day prior to Earth Day, um, we on that Saturday, April 21st, we will be doing a tree planting ceremony, but it's not only going to be tree planting. We're going to have an all-food buffet and then everything else that we can possibly think of to do that's um, tree related. So, mm -hmm. you know, tree activities and things like that. So people that visit Greystone that day um, have the opportunity to plant a tree yes. and have their picture taken with the tree mm -hmm. after, they, um, after they plant it. Right. Uh, that's from one to three? One to four, yep. One to four, yep. okay. And then at thr three o'clock when you get through planting the trees, um, you're going to have a buffet of all foods that come from trees. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, vegans will be happy yes, to very, attend. Very, very happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> vegans are welcome. Yeah. We think it's going to be a great family. Event yeah, I think so. I, I hope we can get out there. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. We'll present the six trees we have up for planting. Mm -hmm. So a family can decide themselves what will be their family tree. Mm -hmm. And then after they learn about their tree, they'll receive a little seedling. Mm -hmm. And they'll get instructions on the proper way to plant it. And then uh, we're ho we'll have a hay rat wagon ride. Oh, a hay wagon to ride. the mm -hmm. planting site. Oh, and they will plant their tree, and then we're going to have it geo spotted for them, so that they'll always be able to find their tree. Mm -hmm. And we think, you know, how better to celebrate Earth Day than to get your hands dirty oh, and sure. to actually do something. And then after the planting, we'll go back to up to the medicine well, as we call it. And we'll have an all tree buffet mm -hmm. laid out, and people can sample all different things from trees. Mm -hmm. We're asking ten dollars for adults mm -hmm. and five dollars for children, and twenty dollars a family oh, as a I donation see. for okay. what we'll be offering to the public. Okay. Okay, it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, Sandy looks like she's got something to. Add. Oh, not much about the tree planting ceremony. Um, it should be amazing. We'll have a bunch of different activities going along. Also, so if you have a young kid who's, you know, hard to entertain while everybody else is looking at trees and stuff, we'll have, you know, tree-related activities going and um, things like that. But I didn't, I didn't know if we also wanted to mention our other um, upcoming events that we have because we, oh, okay. we have a few other things oh, coming okay. up. Um, not. Not as recent as the upcoming uh, you tree planting, but yeah. something about a festival on June 9th. Yep. Um, is that going to be on the order of that one you had the summer before last? It'll be very similar, but a uh -huh. little bit different. Um, this one is going to be more an evening and night festival, so it'll actually start around about 5 p.m. and it'll go to about 10. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do a lot of um, night activities with bats, and mm -hmm. we'll even have like fire spinners and things like that. Um, but during the day, we'll have a few vendors and a few, you know, crafts and things going on around mm -hmm. the daytime animals. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then, sorry, yeah, I was just going to say that the bat, the bat, um, bi-monthly bat watch that's actually right underneath the festival, th that actually, um, 
that one right there is kind of similar to the festival. So the Bat Watch will be um, watching bats <laughs> every every. I think it's second Saturday mm -hmm. of every month for three the months. The second Saturday of every month. Yep, so starting in May through September. Oh, okay. Yep. And then you can go on to our website or our Facebook and we have the dates of everything and the times for when those start. But that'll be sort of like um, a little mini festival every uh, every other Saturday. Mm -hmm. So we'll have, you know, bat, um, acoustic equipment where you can hear their echolocation calls. We'll have, um, you know, an informational area set up and things like that and then we'll have even telescopes to look at the constellations and things like that so it'll be you know these monthly by bi bi-monthly bat watches will be a lovely you know time to just come out at night and experience Greystone and experience night especially since a lot of people don't get to see the stars in the city and stuff you can oh come out yeah. and do that with us. Yeah. And to enjoy the sunset Yes. Oh, we yeah. We pride ourselves that the most beautiful sunset in the world happens mm -hmm. oh, right yeah. there over Lake Erie. And so we'll have it arranged so that people can sit in comfort and watch the sun go down and then learn about bats and mm -hmm. enjoy the nighttime activities. Now, you, there's something mm -hmm. there about medicinal plant mm -hmm. hikes and workshops. Yep. Um, we, we are also very, very, very lucky to have a woman who... Um, her name is Sarah Sorcy. Oh, she yeah. is a naturalist, um, an herb herbalist, I believe mm -hmm. is the proper term. I've been trying to get her on this program yeah. for a long yeah. since <laughs> I started having yes. it, but she's, very she's busy. so busy yeah, that I'm having a lot of trouble. <laughs> right, yeah, but she is an awesome woman and I hope uh -huh. she will have time to come on, but uh -huh. she is um, going to have two different, she's going to have one hike, a medicinal hike on the medicinal trail she actually put in on Greystone mm -hmm. property. And then she'll also do a medicinal workshop where she'll teach people um, how to make things like herbal supplements and stuff to um, better, I guess, better your health mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And okay, so there's going to be two of those, one on June 23rd and the other one on September 22nd. Yes, yep. And the last one sounds really interesting. Laughter yoga classes, TBA. Yes. yes. So um, one one of the young women that we um, have, she's a, she's volunteered at our past events and stuff. She is looking to get trained, and she has a training coming up in July for laughter yoga. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a yoga class that you do some movements and you like learn how to. Um, kind of let go and just like laugh and um, I guess it's it's a very new and upcoming type of yoga and we are hoping that this summer we'll be able to have her come and teach a few classes at Greystone. Oh that sounds like a lot of fun. Yes. yes. Now you've brought some things with you um, so <laughs> let's start uh, let's start looking at them. Um, you have some um, oh that's an actual uh, yep. bat with a bat skeleton correct yeah um, in it um, I'm gonna hold it up so that uh, one of the um, cameras can get a good look at it mm, good work a yeah. good uh, this is a skeleton of a bat and mm -hmm. this is a bat yeah a little taxidermy bat yep so um, that's that's really pretty interesting. Yeah. I I have a nephew that would like to see this. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, he really would. Um, now there are uh, some pieces of wood that they are. There must be a reason that they're here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the bat, the bat skeleton, and our apologies to that bat. I hope it had died before and wasn't killed for that <laughs> sample. Right. But it um, probably wasn't. They represent no, no, some of the that. things we'll be passing out and letting children explore at the mm -hmm. bat watches. Mm -hmm. And this other plethora of stuff comes from the table we will uh, be, show be having at the tree planting. So we have um, let children be aware of petrified wood. That's wood. And to show that hey, this is a tree's flower. A pine cone is actually the flower of a tree. We'll have a variety of pine cones. It's the outer bark of a birch tree. Mm -hmm. Just to hold it, manipulate it. And of course, there's a robin's nest. 
And the good thing about that robin's nest is that the chicks it have has, hatched uh, successfully. It, it has uh, some hatched robins. Yeah. You know, I love the color of robins. Aren't they? It's a beautiful, beautiful color. Now, there's a lot of mud involved in making this nest, I've noticed. This is really hard. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? It's hard, and there's a lot of mud in there. Yeah. That's what we like to have children experience. Yeah. And a fun activity is to give them some mud uh -huh. and some straw. And, and see say, if they can make one. And yeah. they can't. It is, it is just about impossible to, to do replicate what a robin that. can mm -hmm. do with just a beak. And this, of course, do you know what this is, Gail? Um, well, it, uh, okay, it ha it's, uh, has a certain purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's got a point on each end, mm -hmm. and is it used as a tool? No, nope, don't no? think so anthropocentrically. Think mm -hmm. about animals. Oh, oh, a beaver. Yes, a beaver girl. did that. That is oh, the sense yes. of awe and discovery uh -huh. we try yeah, to get at yeah. Greystone. Good. Yeah. Yeah, if I had just said it, but I let your mind fool around with it. Yeah, to, to let children pick this up and touch it and see those little chisel marks, mm -hmm. we think that's really important. I, we also packed everything. They must in have amazing teeth. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you know, their teeth keep growing. They yeah, have I, to be I, I've heard that about various mm -hmm. different uh, animals, that their teeth keep growing. I've heard it about mice, actually. Mm -hmm. so. Rodents, that's I think part of their classification, that their teeth are like that. Mm -hmm. This happens to be, I don't think the camera can see it, but in back of our sign is a wooden crate. It's an antique apple crate. When oh. wood was used for things like that, you think about the labor involved because it was heavy, and then when uh -huh. you put apples in it. Mm -hmm. I like what it says on the sign that's attached to it there. Uh, one generation plants the tree, another gets the shade. Yeah. yeah, it does take a while for a tree to become full grown, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Lots, yes. Of, yeah. lots of and years. For you have... Um, you have a sample. Mm -hmm. This is all Westfield, and it's a tree ring. That it's a time-related tree ring, so it the different um, periods of Westfield are recorded on oh. that, and we think that gives visitors a sense of how old trees really mm -hmm. are. That we think is a fun thing to look at, and then of course trees are somebody's home. Here's yeah. some raccoons yeah. enjoying a tree. Uh, yeah. So what, what the festival, the, it's not really a festival, it is a tree planting, but the Earth Day event will have a table. This is just a few of the things that we'll let children pick up, explore, and hopefully find it their connection to nature mm -hmm. through these simple tree motifs. Mm -hmm. You have a sign up above here too, defend New York's forests. Um, uh, tell tell uh, the viewing audience uh, how you how you go about defending the forests. Well, this might seem a little political, but one way I defend the New York forests is by backing my county executive and saying that yes, we should not not open Chautauqua County to these huge wind farms, mm -hmm. these 500 foot towers that take down our native forests. And once they're up, they're up forever, mm -hmm. but they're taking down two and three hundred year old trees to put them up. That's one way we defend the New York mm -hmm. forests. Another way is that we're planting trees ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really behind the idea that we can't get enough trees. Mm -hmm. We really, really can't. Well, it's my understanding, uh, according to certain experts that I've met and whose writings that I've read, um, that 70% um, uh, of the rainforest has been cut down for grazing 
cattle. Mm-hmm. Yep, unfortunately, that's you know all too um, true. That's very disturbing. It yes. is, yes. And for palm oil, mm-hmm. that's another big one. Palm oil. You mm-hmm. see that in almost you know everything from potato chips. Start looking at that on on all on your packages because they're just taking down the forest to plant these rows of trees. Mm -hmm. And you know, just planting a tree isn't the right thing. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a monoculture, nothing can really live in there but that tree. Mm -hmm. And maybe a few selected animals and plants that get along with the tree. But nature's way, the real way of the world, the real way we all should be, is a rainbow of many different animals, plants, and trees. Lots of diversity, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's yeah. the right word. Well, you didn't tell us yet about uh, the piece of bark. Does Is that uh, birch bark? Yep, this is birch bark. And what we will explain on our tree planting days, how, you know, you heard of birch bark canoe? Well, this mm-hmm. is the beginnings of it. The beginnings of a birch yeah. bark canoe. Native Americans used, you know, we, we like to say they used every part of the buffalo. Most kids mm-hmm. know that. But they actually used nature in uh, uh, thousands of ways that we have lost. The natives out on the West Coast actually made their, their clothing from the cedar bark. And it was beautiful clothing. They have they found ways cedar of, bark, yes, oh of God. weaving it uh-huh. and, and loosening it. So this is just a representative. But looky there, mm-hmm. you can see right through it. Right. We'll, we'll also use this to explain that the middle of every tree is literally dead wood. Mm-hmm. And some of our kids have still heard, you know, your head up here is full of dead wood. But mm-hmm. the real living part of the tree is from the bark. To, or maybe an inch, maybe an inch and a half into the tree. That's where the real life goes on. Mm-hmm. The rest is mm-hmm. for stability and storage. Mm-hmm. So just a little simple thing like this can be full of lessons mm-hmm. of life for students. Well, uh, I had the opportunity to meet a um, naturopathic dentist one time, and uh, she was telling us that, um, well, she has a product uh, that she makes, um, and you can get it around here. Um, she calls it Zellies, um, and it's made out of it's mints that are made out of birch bark. That um, you, after a meal, uh, you dissolve a couple of them in your mouth, and they'll neutralize the acid that formed in your mouth by just. Uh, when you just ate the meal, mm-hmm. and uh, and it actually helps to remineralize your teeth. And I remember her saying that the Native Americans always used to bite into the bark of the birch trees as a way to prevent their teeth from deteriorating. Yeah, so yeah, so I, really I cool. thought that was a pretty interesting story. Yeah. I'd like to get that dentist on this program yeah. sometime. Yeah, that would yeah. be good. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so a real fresh perspective from yeah. ancient times. Yeah, yeah. A fresh pers- perspective from ancient times. Yeah. Although I don't, not sure how ancient it, it actually is. But right. um, Well, you're involved uh, with something that has to do with uh, Native American culture, um, aren't you, um, uh, Diane? Uh, you ha- usually put up a teepee on your property yes, every year for the summer months. Part of our months, Greystone And uh, things like that. And you teach a class at Chautauqua, right? Mm-hmm. We like the, we have a 22 foot plains teepee. So our, our natives here didn't live in teepees. But it's just such a dramatic building. Mm-hmm. And we like to take the children or the visitors in and let them sit in that conical shape. And mm-hmm. again, we, all, we crave circles. Circles are very grounding. And when, when you're in that TP, everybody is kind of equal because we're, we're in an enclosed area that is sloping upwards as if to say there's a greater force above us. So we use the TP a lot, not so much for camping or for hooping it up, mm-hmm. but for sitting and contemplating and maybe hearing some serious lessons. And then, yes, I do teach at Chautauqua Institution 
I've been there for 18 years in the special studies class, mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't know about that. The that special studies oh, classes? Oh, yeah, there's yeah. a whole world of education. Well, yes. You know, I, I taught uh, a class over there you know, a couple of summers. I taught a macrame class. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's awesome. So, um, yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty interesting. The people that come to Chautauqua in the summer are really interested in learning. Mm -hmm. And that's... Uh, that's why they sign up for the classes while they are there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember before I taught the first time, somebody who'd already taught uh, told me, you're going to love your students, you know. Uh, right. They're really serious about learning something. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So um, now uh, I, I wanted to mention that, uh, Sandy, that uh, Diane tells me you've become quite an expert on the topics of of uh, bats and um, bats and invasive species plants. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I guess uh, she wants you to become quite well known, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, for it. Uh, yeah. um, uh, 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 is it possible? Uh, are you? Do you welcome people to get in touch with you? Uh, yeah. Yes. Of course. Um, um, I wouldn't quite call myself an expert yet. Um, I do know a lot about our local bats, um, but I also do know a lot of people who are, I would consider, um, experts, such as uh, Jonathan Townsend. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of work in this area with our bats, and mm -hmm. you know, he he's been. I think Diane told me that his mom told her <laughs> that he's been interested in bats since he was like three or something like that. Yeah. And so, like, I I know some people who really are experts but I would say I'm like a mini expert. A mini would, expert. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I would love to, you know, if anybody has questions or concerns, like definitely get a hold of me. Um, my information's on our website mm -hmm. and on our Facebook. So, you know, if anybody has any questions or any concerns, uh, you know, definitely get a hold of me. And if I can't answer them, I can find somebody mm -hmm. who can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so do you have other interests too? Yeah, I mean, um, so outside of nature and you know and volunteering and all that stuff, mm -hmm. I, I love it, like animals, mm -hmm. but um, especially love my two dogs. I have a Great Dane and a Lab, and they're, oh, they're yeah. they take up most of my time. But mm -hmm. other than them, um, I also fire spin on the side, which is oh. you know you use um, equipment like a fire hoop or um, some people juggle fire, some people eat fire. Mm -hmm. I use the hula hoop, and you pretty much just dance with the fire and stuff. Oh, like that. you dance with fire. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's called fire spinning, so okay. I do that. Yeah, that's my hobby. Okay. Um, is it, that's your exercise. Yep, then. Yeah, that's, yeah. My, that's my hobby and my exercise. Okay. Yeah. And, um, okay, so um, uh, let me see here. Um, I <laughs> lost my train of thought. Oh, I had a question fine. I yeah. was getting ready to <laughs> ask you, and I've lost track she of She ought to tell you about her work with invasive species. Yeah. Okay. Because some of it isn't all that pleasant, but right. she's is that with it. Yeah. Well, I've, like, you know, ever since I started schooling in environmental science, I have always been very interested in um, invasive species because mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they don't harp on it, but they definitely drive it in at school that, mm -hmm. you know, we definitely mm -hmm. want to do as much as we can to avoid them. So then once I learned about them, I, from there, just expanded and I got, I've been receiving jobs in the field of invasive species for almost four years now. Mm -hmm. And I've done everything from, I've worked with the it's not Jamestown anymore, sorry. It's the Audubon Community Nature Center in Jamestown. Oh, okay. Um, the, they I changed the name. Yes, then. yes, okay. they did, yeah. Um, so they had me as their water chestnut coordinator. So that's an aquatic um, invasive species. And I was out there, you know, in their ponds eradicating that. Um, I've also worked with um, the DCNR up in Erie, which is very similar to our DC DEC. Um, so up in Erie, I worked with um, Presque Isle State Park, mm -hmm. and we took care of all of their invasives there. Mm -hmm. That was probably what Diane was uh, mentioning was not the so pleasant part. Uh -oh. um, we use a lot of herbicides there, but it's because the invasives are so bad and so much there. Oh, really? The hand pulling mm -hmm. and stuff like that is, it's not as beneficial as going in and using a herbicide. Mm -hmm. So. Um, 
that was, you know, again, I don't like to kill things, but when it comes to invasive species, it's almost you have to because they are killing all of the local environment, and then that, you know, mm -hmm. cascades down from there. Mm -hmm. It hurts, you know, the local environment, that hurts the animals, that hurts us, and mm -hmm. therefore, so. Well, you know, I think the scariest invasive species that I've heard of is mm -hmm. uh, something called pigweed. Okay, yeah. Are you familiar with that at all? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Uh, it sounds like it's pretty deadly, you know? Like right. Like poison ivy, only worse. Right. And then, and then it's really big or something. It grows to be how many feet tall? I'm not sure of the exact, but, but, but it's very, very large, tall, yeah. very tall. Yeah. Uh, and pushes out the natives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the and so what are they doing about that? Do you know? Or? I don't specifically know about that one. Um, and seeing as it's like more detrimental to human health, they're probably using more of a herbicide treatment on those type of things mm -hmm. rather than, you know, risking people actually coming into contact mm -hmm. with them and, and mm -hmm. hurting you know themselves so mm -hmm. I would say that that's probably more of a herbicide use well where did where did this pigweed come from I'm not sure I don't know the exact origin um, most <laughs> most invasives actually come from Europe or mm -hmm. you know Asia mm -hmm. and China those kind of areas so yeah, yeah it sounds like something that would, that would probably come from an oriental yeah, country yeah. the invasive yeah. weed battle at Greystone Nature Preserve mm -hmm. Sounds so beautiful, honeysuckle, mm -hmm. European honeysuckle. It was, it was actually sponsored by the DEC as something farmers could use on their hedgerows. Yeah. But this plant starts and it just grows and grows and grows, and it does produce some flowers. But our animals, our butterflies, yeah. aren't used to using it, mm -hmm. and they they're not getting any benefit from mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And it does produce red berries in the fall. But our birds can't digest them. Oh. There are actually studies in the Carolinas of lines of migratory birds flying south. They filled themselves with these berries, didn't do anything but inhibit their flight. Oh. And they're found dead with the berries oh, no. still. Can you imagine undigested lines of inside birds of them? Laying on the ground because of these berries. So from now until the middle of summer when the roots are too much into the hard, hardness of the earth, mm -hmm. we'll be out there pulling up these mm -hmm. honeysuckles. And there's not much you can do with them except to chop them up and burn them. Because mm -hmm. if you just put one little part of them on the ground, they'll find a way to grow yeah. back again. Yeah. So they're our big, big invasive at Greystone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I want to thank you again for coming on today. It's been really interesting. Um, I've really enjoyed the talk. Uh, maybe we can have you on again sometime. Uh, we've come to the end of another episode of Fresh Perspectives, and I'll see the rest of you in a couple of weeks. So, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>